In the 1960s, the physical exploration of space turned from being an ambitious idea into a reality. However, this was followed by an intense competition known as the Space Race between the Soviet Union and the United States. These two nations would later beat themselves to winning the spot for different first-time events in space. In 1957, the Soviet Union gained the upper hand by launching the first satellite into Earth's orbit. This success started what was known as the Sputnik Crisis in Western nations. This was a period of public fear and anxiety because they didn't know what the Soviet Union were up to. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union launched Vostok 1, which was the first manned spacecraft ever. They beat the US to put the first man, Yuri Gagarin, in space. He orbited the Earth for 108 minutes, after which he made a re-entry before ejecting the spacecraft by a parachute. The US responded to this in just 23 days by sending Alan Shepard to space on May 5, 1961. The Soviet Union, not ready to give up, sent the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova, into space two years later, on June 16, 1963. However, the US only followed 20 years later by sending Sally Ride into space on June 18, 1983. Random people were not just selected to represent their countries. These brave astronauts and cosmonauts deserve a place in history. For instance, Valentina Tereshkova was 26 years old when she became the first woman in space. However, some people believe that Valentina may not be the first woman in space. Let's assume that this is true. Then it would be a heartbreaking story of a lost female cosmonaut in space. We may not have the name of this lost female cosmonaut, but her final words were not lost with her. Let's quickly go back to our earlier discussion on the Sputnik crisis. Remember that we said that this was a period of public fear and anxiety because the US didn't know what the Soviet Union were up to. It turned out that it was nothing to worry about, as Sputnik was simply a radio transmitter sending signals back to Earth. In fact, some people were able to record these signals on the radio. Thereafter, many amateur radio enthusiasts began trying to listen to and record signals from other satellites launched into space. Many people found this interesting, but a particular team became very successful in recording audio signals from space. This team was made up of two brothers, Achille and Giovanni Giudica Cordelia. They reported that they had successfully recorded signals from Sputnik 1 and 2. Sputnik 2 was the first spacecraft carrying a living animal into Earth orbit, and they recorded a sound that they believed to be the heartbeat of Laika, the dog in the spacecraft. Also, they recorded the radio signals from other important missions, such as the US first satellite, Explorer 1. These successes made them so famous back then that they acquired an old German bunker named Tora Forte to set up a proper listening station. Now, these two realized that if they wanted to become famous, they needed to improve their listening station. What they had before that time could only pick up signals from space vehicles that passed over their town. So they realized that they needed a movable dish antenna. Standard government listening stations at that time would cost millions of dollars to build. But these brothers didn't have money, so they built everything by themselves using crude tools salvaged from junkyards. With time, they were able to figure out if a signal was coming from Earth or space, as well as the speed of the satellite transmitting the signals. Perhaps what made them famous was that they were able to pick up signals from classified missions that were never reported by the Soviet Union. Some of these signals supported allegations that the Soviet Union had covered up cosmonaut deaths from the public. For instance, on November 28, 1960, they received a faint SOS signal from what seemed to be a troubled cosmonaut. They were able to predict from the signal that the spacecraft was leaving Earth very fast. Since an unmanned spacecraft would not send a distress signal, they assumed that there must have been someone on that troubled spacecraft. In February 1961, they picked up another signal, and this time around, it was the sound of a cosmonaut suffocating to death. In April that same year, the brothers picked up a signal from a capsule that orbited the Earth just a few days before Yuri Gagarin's April 12th historical flight. This also made some people question if Yuri Gagarin was truly the first man in space. One of the suggestions is that Vladimir Lyushin, a test pilot, could have been the first person in space, although he was announced to be in a fatal car crash two days before Gagarin's flight. Could that be a cover-up for the earlier flight mishap recorded by the brothers? The most controversial and heartbreaking recording that has remained unsolved until today was in May 1961. These brothers recorded a distress call from a female cosmonaut that was heading back to Earth. Uh, 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 
She was asking if she was going to crash because she could see fire and the place was hot. The brothers assumed that these were the final words of a cosmonaut about to crash. Although her words were not clear, she repeatedly said, I feel hot, I feel hot. Her voice became more tensed as she asked, Isn't it dangerous? Later on, she echoed, I see fire, I see fire. Finally, her last words were, Am I going to crash? Please? Well, the Soviet Union denied that this ever happened. There were no records of any mission or a spacecraft that was launched at that time. We could assume that the Soviet Union was telling the truth and just let the case die, but they have a history of covering up failed missions. The space race was not just to see who got to space first. It was also a tool for propaganda. For instance, when the Soviet Union successfully launched the first satellite in 1957, the US didn't know what it looked like or what it was doing in space. This created fear in them, and that was exactly what the Soviet Union wanted. Since any record of failure may be seen as weakness, they were highly secretive about most of their missions and reported only those that were successful. For instance, the US became the first country to send humans to the moon on June 20th, 1969. To show that they had what it takes, they were supposed to send their team to the moon as well. However, their attempted mission failed and they publicly denied ever being in competition with the US in sending humans to the moon. In one of the secret attempts to launch their rockets, it crashed back on the launch pad, causing an explosion that would later become one of the largest artificial non-nuclear explosions. The details about this event were kept secret until after a decade. Another piece of information that was kept secret was the death of a fighter pilot, Valentin Bodarenko, who died in a fire accident. The government concealed his death and identity as a member of the Cosmonaut Corps for several years. During the dissolution of the Soviet Union, many pieces of information were declassified. Some secret missions and accidents that happened were exposed to the public. So now you may want to ask again if they ever found out the truth about the lost female in space. Many documents have been uncovered, yet there is no mention of such a mission. Also, there are claims that not everything published by the two brothers was true. For example, their report of an SOS call from a spacecraft leaving Earth might not be accurate. During that time, the spacecraft available did not have propulsion that was powerful enough to leave the Earth's orbit. As for the lost female cosmonaut, there are several reasons why her case might not be true. First, she didn't follow standard communication protocol like a true cosmonaut. She didn't identify herself, and she was not using correct technical terminologies. Her sentences had many grammatical errors and were disjointed. The USSR only used well-trained and highly educated Russian speakers. And from the way she was communicating, she was probably not one. Another argument was, if the call was true, why did bigger listening stations with better equipment not receive the signal? Finally, it would have been impossible for her to make a distress call if she was crashing to the Earth. During the phase of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, there is always a blackout that prevents the transmission of radio signals. In other words, the brothers wouldn't have received the distress call. So what do you think? Is it possible that these brothers made up the whole story just to gain more attention? Do you think that we'll later find out information about her mission? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And don't forget to like this video and subscribe to get more interesting updates from this channel.